Welcome everyone for the second event of our hot skill series. Um, this is an event on the back on as part of the back to school campaign, which is organized in partnership between the steam it career advisors network, the stem alliance and its industry partners and scientex. In the hot skill webinar, you will learn about the stem jobs of the future, the companies that create them and the skills your students need to go get them. My name is Eddie Grenmeyer, and I'm a pedagogical and project officer for European Schoolnet, and it is my pleasure to be your host tonight. With us are Rocio Benito, Ivana Kovac, and Chanel Martinez. They are available in the chat and they will handle all technical aspects of the webinar. So if you need anything from them, do not hesitate to reach out in the chat. A bit of housekeeping rules before we get started. Uh, the signatures list or the participations list, it's very important. It's mandatory for us um, and it will help us continue organize events like this one. And it is necessary for you to get a certificate of participation or of attendance. So please take a moment to sign it. Uh, my colleagues are sharing it in the chat right now. So click on the link, take a second to fill it in. That applies to our speakers as well. Uh, so at some point throughout the webinar, please do so, do so. Uh, a final point, the webinar is recorded and it will be shared on YouTube. So the cameras and the microphones are off. The questions will be taken in writing in the chat. So please do not hesitate to post your questions for our speakers and we will relay, the, relay them to them uh, at the end of each section. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for signing the participation list. Uh, my colleagues will share it again because as people arrive, they may not have access to the chat from before. But now it's time for business. We are very pleased to have with us Janet Axiza. She's the Director General of the Foundation for Transport and uh, she will share with us some information about the Foundation for Transport. We have, and Janet will be joined uh, by Marc Chappelle, uh, who's a captain, and Andrew Spiteri, who's a researcher, and they'll both tell us more about the future careers, the current careers, and the future of, tra of maritime transport. Thank you very much to the three of you for joining today. Janet, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie, and thank you for this opportunity to be able to reach out to as many teachers and career gardens uh, in all over Europe. So thank you very much once again. So uh, today, the Foundation for Transport is here to answer a million dollar question, how to build the next generation in transport. Um, we will try this by proposing three personalities, as Andrew was, uh, as Eddie was saying earlier on. One of them will be a student to student inspiration. But today we will try to to identify and illustrate that through enthusiasm, through passion, hands-on experience, personality, and curiosity, they can act in different ways. Uh, as role models and inspire teachers, guidance and students alike. Uh, we are will be proposing three different personalities from three different generations, all from Malta, all three from Malta. And obviously we will have all three of them have uh, an international context in different ways. To start with, we have an 11 year old because for obvious reasons, since he is a minor, we couldn't get him over here. But you can follow him on his Facebook page, Matthew, the Young Aviator, and on a YouTube video. Uh, there are various ones, a podcast, uh, an interview, but also there is a tutorial, a one hour tutorial that Matthew is explaining how to fly a Boeing 787 in English on a simulator. So here, this 11 year old, to his curiosity and to, to his um, keen to learn more about science in aviation, together with his good command of English, digital skills and self-confidence, and believe me, you have to see it, he can uh, inspire a lot of 11 year old, fellow 11 year olds and other students. He was recently awarded a silver medal, the second he became second in the world 
in designing an airport digital on a digital platform. And you can see a quote here on the screen. He was described as part of the next generation of aviation professionals throughout the world after seeing the level of enthusiasm and effort that Matthew has put into his airport design. This Federal Aviation Administration, which is in the United States, are confident that the aviation industry, loved by so many since its earliest years, is in good hands. Such an endorsement, it's simply outstanding. So I invite you to follow this 11-year-old Matthew Fennec in his Facebook page, Matthew the Young Aviator, and on YouTube, uh, either on podcast interviews indicating how he got hooked on STEM, on science in aviation, how, how he, he describes his curiosity, how he looks for uh, more information every day, and to inspire other students, he's describing how to fly a Boeing on a, uh, on a simulator in a one hour English, uh, in English, um, giving instructions in English. So uh, with further ado, without further ado, I would like to pass on uh, the floor to Eddie and on to Mark, I think, who will be giving two important, um, uh, let's say, career pathways of how maritime can be applied onshore and offshore. So off to you, Ali. Thank you very much, Annette. Yes, we'll hear from Mark now. So Mark, you can now, you should be able to take control of the slides and well, I guess, take us on a ship. Okay. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Jeanette, for the introduction and uh, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Um, well, this is a very particular uh, effort we are making. Uh, I think it is something quite, shall we say, unique. And um, what I would like to talk to you about this afternoon is something that we have developed quite well in Malta, and that is working, shall we say, to some extent as it should. But I cannot give you any statistical results yet because you will see later on in, in the presentation how it works out. Now, my uh, application of science is to the maritime industry. And I think there's a write-up about what I do, what I did, and my background. So I won't waste time introducing myself. I'll just tell you my name is Captain Mark A. Chappell. I've been to sea for 30 years. And I've spent the last, shall we say, 16 years uh, working uh, for the Ad Maltese administration and for Transport Malta. So off we go. We're going to go into our presentation, if I can find the control button for that. Um, I'm not, I, can't, I don't seem to have it. Should be just under the under your slides. No, I haven't got it there. It looks like Jeanette still has control of the slides. Ah, uh, 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 okay, let looking. me. Okay, so, I've got it now. There we are. Got it. Got it. No. No. Here we go. Okay, can you see we that? Go. We're yes, talking about Teen Science Cafe. And a Teen Science Cafe, there's no coffee involved at all in this. I'll just give a very quick explanation. We go to a school, a number of STEM uh, personnel, uh, all with different, of course, uh, jobs in life. And we take clusters of about 10 to 15 max uh, students around us. And we explain to them the application of science to the job that it is we are doing. And well, this is where I start from. It's very simple. It is a fact that the students I'm confronting are already uh, learning some form of science. And so they already begin to understand. But one very important aspect is that they must realize that if they do choose any of those science subjects, they must remember always that maths and English are exceptionally important in being able to handle this. Because many for us Maltese, of course, because all our technical books are written in English. And so it would make a lot of sense 
that you could speak English properly to understand exactly what is being transmitted. So one of the techniques I have developed over the years is to teach the students what etymology is all about. And I put those there so that many science teachers never tell their students that uh, fusica means something natural and that bios is coming from the word life. It takes away half the weight of the subject if they know exactly what it means. And uh, uh, alchemia is an Arab word. The article L is L. And you can see that's, of course, how to proceed, isn't it? Well, this is a very important slide. In actual fact, it's three slides put together for the simple reason that we're going to go through physics, um, biology and chemistry in their applied form, not totally, but in some aspects, some which might appeal to children, uh, young children or, or, or these um, young students, I'd say 13 to 14. I'm looking at this age. Uh, that's the target target age where they select then physics and carry on uh, up the ladder into tertiary education. One thing to observe is like we've got flotation, light, mechanics. Uh, uh, these, these are things which um, young people can already associate with. Heat, can you feel heat in the room? Can you see light? Yes, they're all things existent. Maybe not magnetism, but gravity is there. As I tell them otherwise, it had to pull you down from the ceiling if there wasn't gravity and stuff like that. And then we go into biology and we look at microorganisms, we look at marine life, we look at seafood. And I tell them, do you like seafood? And many say, yes, of course. And I tell them, how would you like to eat seafood from a polluted sea? And they say, no, 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 of course, we don't want that. And then we carry on into things like growth on the bottom of the ship and uh, anti-fouling and what have you. And we're looking at chemicals after that and into protective paints and we're looking at lubrication for engines and new clean fuels chemical. So this is a complicated slide. I'm wasting a couple of minutes on it because any teacher teaching uh, a science must know some application and some application must apply to the maritime industry. So let's take a look. Let's go one step further and see uh, what it's got for us. Where are we? Okay. Oh, I think oh, this isn't working. So the next question I normally ask them is, can you see physics on this ship? Right? And it might be a tricky question, but I can. I can see light. I can see gravity. I can see friction. I can see the very fact that the ship is afloat means that there is something of physics in there. The fact that there's a heat engine means that that's the type of propulsion. The fact that there are cranes means that there's mechanics on it. And of course, let's jump straight into it. If the ship is afloat, then it's definitely related to Archimedes' principle. And the very fact that what? That his body displaced an amount of water which is equal to the weight of his body is exactly the same thing that's happening with ships. The amount of water displaced by a ship is equal to that. But I wonder if I can use my arrow. No, I can't. But what it all boils down to, and young people will understand, is that if I throw a ball of, of plasticine into water, it would go straight down to the bottom. But if I do change its volume, and this is density and so on and so forth, uh, and it will remain afloat, which is the marvel of steel ships not sinking, isn't it? And think about it. But there are other things that strike their interest. And, and of course, OK, this perhaps is more male orientated is the heat engine. But you'd be surprised from the slides that come up later on that there are women that work uh, in the engine room and have taken this task wholeheartedly and can um, follow what's going on as much as anybody from the, the male gender. Um, I tend to use slides 
which are, shall we say, associated with the island. We have one of these down in a port called Marseschlok, which means the harbour of the southeast. And as many of these youngsters might pass by and see the ship there, then they might associate and, and giving a small explanation of the pressure type of pressure inside a gas carrier might give them an, an insight into, oh, so that's what that ship is there for. Oh, that's what it does. Oh, I wonder what it would be like working on one of those things if perhaps they might get that far. Um, uh -huh. Now have a look at this. Now we're looking at barnacles and growth on the bottom of the ship. And you say, well, there is science there. The growth itself, right, is something that has life in it. So um, we then ask, why is it there? Is it related to temperature? That's science, that's physics. Everything that we are looking at in the maritime industry is so scientific. There it is, there's your barnacles. And this slide shows us how the Knights of Malta removed or scrub the bottom of a ship, if you like, to remove those barnacles, because they were in what they had was the corso. The corso was a form of piratry. And if you're a pirate, you want a ship that moves fast. And so you wanted the bottom of your ship to be as clean as possible so that you could go fast. But look at the task in trying to remove that. And then look at the application, if you like, of chemistry. What has chemistry done? Two things. You put the ship into a dry dock, you need to pump the water out. Pumps was mentioned in physics, so we're removing the water. Once you've removed the water, you can scrub the water, the bottom of the ship, using extremely high pressure, and that removes all the barnacles. And then you apply chemistry by putting on some paint, which for two or three years, Organitin free, which means it's environmentally friendly, will keep the bottom of your ship nice and clean and she will go through the water a lot faster. So let's move on to something else now. And the next one would be, oh, I think I've skipped the slide there, sorry. The next one's uh, biology and we're looking at marine life. Uh, and there's a lot more to marine biology than meets the eye. Remember one thing, that marine biology is not just, um, let's say, the living animal, marine life, conserving marine life, because that is our food. It is also research into marine biology, which in many cases must be done at sea, or you have to be at sea to get the, the uh, shall we say, the statistics that you may need the samples that you may need and things like that. But marine biology is a much, much, much bigger thing than, than we seem to realize. Uh, we all know about it. I put in, I put in this slide because in about six years from when you, when they have decided to take up physics, some of these young people may be of an age and have a certificate of competence that would place them on board a ship in a responsible capacity of taking a watch on their own. So I think that we don't realize that six years is a very short time in our life. So we really must make the best of, of that studying period. And I think this is another very important slide. I have put in white the uh, speech bubble, which talks about manning, because my target is always to get people to go to sea. I know it, you may not all agree with it, and a lot of mothers don't agree with it because they say, oh, no, 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 my son's not going to sea. Well, uh, the fact is that that is my target. But if you look at the peripheral of that ship, you will see 
that there is ship management and there are degrees in ship management and stuff like that. And there is ship supplies and, and victualling and putting food on board a ship. And there's civil protection. We need, of course, search and rescue and a whole load of stuff like that. Maritime law is probably the one which does not have science in it, but maritime law does require experts that have uh, scientific knowledge to be able to prove certain uh, cases and what have you. We've got shipbuilding, which takes us into naval architecture, structures, uh, the type of steel you're going to use, gravity, all is prepared on plan. It cannot be that once you launch the ship, it goes belly up and, and, and then you have a situation. So it's all done on plan and it all moves from there. And then, of course, the most important commodity of a ship is the cargo, whether it's people or whatever it is. It usually or very often costs more than the actual ship itself does. So imagine, I'll go back one slide. Imagine these young people looking after a ship which can cost up to 100, 150 million dollars and a cargo which costs just as much and they're nothing more than 20 years old. It is uh, sort of asking a lot, isn't it? One would think. OK, so which type of ship would you like to work on? There's so many. There's, there's going from yachts. You can join the Navy. You can join the military Navy, if you like, and the merchant Navy, passenger ships, row packs. You can go on drill ships. You can go on Oh, they're all there. There's there's so much to say about them, but I haven't got the time. And strictly speaking, going to sea means you're divided into three parts. You're either in the deck department. That's where you drive. That's the uh, the cushy one, as one might put it. The kitchen is a hot place to work in, but of course, um, it has its scientific value as well because all cooks on board a ship now they must be properly qualified and they must have food handling uh, um, techniques and certification, which means that they have to go through some scientific training as well, if you like, uh, in terms of biology and uh, bacteria and stuff like that. And of course, food combining and uh, and diets and, and what have you. So, so there's a lot of biology, I suppose, in that one as well. And then the engine room department, which relates mainly to heat engines, but uh, of course, pressure and fuel transfer and uh, many, many of those things that we we mentioned earlier. Uh, I'll guide you properly in this one and tell you that um, in Malta, we have two colleges that can handle uh, maritime training for, for deck officers, engine room officers, and so on. In your countries, I, I don't know, I saw Greece, and maybe from the Netherlands, and from different places, each one of the colleges that does mar marine uh, maritime training, you will have to, to assist them, perhaps, into arriving at um, what I call the prospectus okay we're, we're going to get there and one disappointing aspect and I, I use this slide very often in the career guidance more than in the teen science cafe is the mqf equivalent of what is a master mariner or, or a chief engineer what is it it's a four or a five Despite the fact, it says so at the top of the slide there, you can see it, despite the fact that to become a master mariner, you need 28,000 contact hours, whereas to get a master's degree, you need no more than 11,000 contact hours. Right, so what I'm saying is perhaps a little bit out of the box because one is an academic subject and you get academic training and the other one is a certificate of competency two completely different things but for all intents and purposes for the U european union this is a disqualifying factor when they there is a call for a call for applications for a job and says that you need an mqf level seven and of course, a guy who's been at sea for the last 15 years, let's say, cannot get the job because he has not achieved the MQF level. So somebody might want to take some research into that. I put this picture in because young people like to do wheelies on motorbikes. <clears throat> 
pardon me. And so I thought, uh, well, you can do wheelies with chips. That's, of course, if you've got some sort of problem in the four peak tank uh, uh, or something like that, and you need to do some welding and get the ship uh, out of the water. Um, this is where my career at sea started uh, on a ship like this. Uh, uh, this went from the UK to the Netherlands, and then we went down to South America, did Brazil, did Argentina and Uruguay, and you, you're nothing more than 20 years old. You've left home. Um, it's uh, you, you're amongst horrible men, huh? and men are men are the topic on ships, aren't they? But that's changing and changing rapidly, as there are at least six lady captains in Malta now, uh, all came out of our, uh, uh, shall we say. Uh, maritime training center. This is a picture that when I look at it, it brings back memories of the camaraderie that exists on board ship. Remember that on board ship, you have a watch. You're on the 12 to 4, 4 to 8, or, or 8 to 12. And if you're late for your watch, expect that the next chap is going to be late to relieve you. So everything is in perfect balance and in harmony. Unless you are as sick as a dog, you turn up for work, normally and people ha live in a certain harmony in such a confined space I, there is one saying i must tell it to you that no seaman will have contrivance enough to end up in a jail for being on a ship is like being in a jail with the danger of drowning so remember that and of course nobody would do anything that is untoward there are surprises yes and i that's the wrong saint. Hey, Halo's on the wrong saint. There, it should be on Saint John Paul. And we had this uh, wonderful occasion. We took Pope John Paul from the Grand Harbour to Valletta, and then from Valletta took him down to Saint Paul's Bay, uh, and he blessed an underwater statue. And it, 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 it was something. Some friends of mine said, "Oh, you should put that in your CV." Well. Uh, I met a saint before he actually became a saint. Uh, this was my last command. Um, in actual fact, there was another ship after this, but I wasn't in command. I was a superintendent and we fetched the ship from Australia during high season when the piracy uh, business was still going on. So um, where have I got to now? So my job on board ship ended, as I said, uh, 15, 16 years ago now. And uh, since then, I moved to the administration. But that also took me places. And on a large number of times, I represented Malta as head of uh, delegation, very often as altern alternate uh, representative. But uh, to get to speak at the IMO is, is quite a thing. And it takes a lot of guts to speak in front of 600 people live, looking at yourself in the camera in front of you, but knowing that what it is you are doing is for the safety of seamen uh, uh, at sea. I'm coming to the end now. I'm stopping here. And you're all asking, why did he put that toy ship up there? What's the meaning of that? And um, I'll tell you why. Because every time I see a toy shop, I go into the toy shop. And I say, have you got boats or ships for sale? And they tell me, sorry, sir, we don't sell those anymore. And I put there, I said, research at university level. The tablet and the screen has grossly replaced many toys that we knew in our childhood. But I believe sincerely that the fact that a toy boat is not available anymore except in summer season when perhaps a few parents might buy one or two for some real baby toddlers and put them in a pool or in a bath or something but no no ship models and and i think that is very uh, worrying okay we are here um this is what Ketak Lim said and he said it provides you the chance to see uh, sorry, it's not Kita Klim is the present Secretary General. This is Koji Sekumitsu. He, these are his words, not mine. He said, the chance to see the world and get paid for doing so. So that's wonderful, isn't it? And then, of course, it's a springboard, as happened to me in my life, for related professional jobs in the maritime industry. Your country 
seriously needs you, especially if you're from the EU, because we have a, um, a, a, a diminishing number of deck officers and engine room officers, and they're being replaced by uh, all kinds of Chinese, Korean uh, officers from Filipino, from different countries, but outside the EU. Remember that many of those officers, if they're going to take up secondary jobs, have to be from that country or should be from that country, and we should uh, work on that. Thank you for listening to me. I wish I could have spent more time with you and told you more about it. If you have any questions, you may use the chat. If you wish to communicate with me directly, grab a screenshot of that. You uh, Feel free to go ahead and do so. That's it from my Thank part. And, uh, Thank you, Mark. Uh, j just so you know, we are putting the we are putting the recording of the webinar online, so we are putting your phone number on the internet. Okay, well, so yeah, okay, you'll no you'll get you'll get phone calls, I'm sure. No worries. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, sharing that passion with us. Uh, you made us travel. You made us meet celebrities. You made us meet a saint. So, what more could we ask? Well, I've got more to ask. Uh, because you, you've told us where your journey started on a ship, uh, but where did it start before that? It, it, when you were when you were a young child uh, in school, uh, being taught STEM, were you passionate about STEM? Were you thinking about going on a ship uh, back then no. before getting on it? Far from it. In actual fact, I wasn't. I wasn't a good scholar as a young lad, and um, well, uh, it depends on your company and I sort of got attracted into some bad company and of course my school school rating wasn't doing too good got to fifth form and of course uh, you get thrown out of school and so you, there is a point where you have to take a decision and there was a choice of two things fixing digital watches or a career at sea because there were still two vacancies in that class so it is by chance that this happened and of course they told me, but look here, young fellow, you haven't got sufficient qualification to attend this course. You'll need to work hard at it. Well, the very application of physics during the lessons of like, you know, we actually had to do physics and at the applied part of physics helped me to get better grades in my O-level physics. And so um, things worked always in favor. Right, it was money for old rope all the way. No, I wasn't a very good, what's it? But I went to the top. I carried on. I took evening classes. I think once you've set your course, then you must follow it, and and that is how it worked. And then you 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 get exposed to the sciences without even realizing uh, their application. That's how it goes. Thank you. Well, you've heard it uh, straight from the captain's mouth. Uh, the real world, seeing it in action, is what can create a passion for STEM, even if the passion doesn't exist in the first place. Thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation. You're welcome. It's been very exciting. I have traveled a lot. You made me want to go, maybe yeah. not work on a ship, but at the very least, take a holiday on one. Thank you very much. Now, we've talked to someone who didn't do so good at school, wasn't a scholar, uh, and still found a way to STEM. Now we'll talk to someone who is very much a scholar uh, and has a passion for STEM in the first place. We're going to hear from Andrew and from his um, research on new technologies to take uh, green technologies to sea. Andrew, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. It was very interesting as well. So I was talking about how I came around to do my PhD in, in marine engineering and my pathway towards the journey and forward. So uh, should go out. Okay. So basically, this is the part I took. I got my A levels and I got my uh, mechanical engineering degree from the University of Malta. I then came over to Liverpool. I got my master's in marine and offshore engineering. I'm currently I'm at the same university, Liverpool John Boys University, and I'm finalizing my PhD, which is in green technologies, and I'll continue working within the space of maritime decarbonization using these technologies. Now, 
growing up, I was always surrounded um, with people from the maritime industry. So that's where my initial love came. Both my grandparents were in the Navy and my father um, always did maritime jobs. And unfortunately, or fortunately, my mother was one of the mothers you mentioned, Mark, was the first job I wanted to do was to go to sea, but she immediately shut that idea down when I was very young. So then as I started you know, going into school at Chet, I found myself was very good at physics and I was okay at maths. I, I, I was never very brilliant at maths. And I knew I wanted to work in the maritime industry. I liked research and design as well at, at that time. We used to call it just the building because we used to have discovery channel and the building stuff is art, something I want to do. And I was also very interested in sustainability. So at the time, whoever I talked to, everyone told me I have to do maths and physics and you have to go down to engineering. And this was maybe 17 years ago. And um, going for everything was very com 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 um, compartmentalized, kind of. We either did engineering or did a country, became a lawyer. There wasn't as much subjects as maybe now data analysis or different types of engineering as there was at that time. And then for secondary subjects, I graphical communication and technology and design. And I was very lucky that technology and design was the first year it was given as an O level, because before you see subject, you weren't given a certificate. And for me, this is a very interesting subject as I was always very hands on. And this was the only subject where you could build stuff, make a proper plan from initial, um, like what was the problem, how we're going to solve it, how we're going to build it, and, and what, you, what you, does your solution actually solve? Um, so I did my O levels in that. I, I continued these subjects up to A levels, my maths, my physics, and graphic communication. Of course, at the time, everybody um, tried to push me into chemistry as well, as Mark was saying, um, but I preferred to do. Um, I really loved chemistry, but I couldn't understand how to add chemicals together and covalent bonds. And even when I was finishing my degree, I, I chose materials one of my subjects. I still had that problem. Funny enough, my father then was very good at that, so to give me a helping hand throughout that subject. So um, from the maritime industry, I did my degree in industrial materials engineering. And I mean, it was a bit of a deviation, but the reason I did that was because at that time in Malta, most of the R&D research and design was being done in industrial materials. So I thought, if I won't leave the country, at least I, I, will, I will work in research and design, and I can keep the maritime industry kind of as my hobby and my go-to kind of extra subject. I managed to get an intern at Trelleborg Seeding Solutions, and then I continued to do my thesis. And over here, I was lucky as well to do some research and design for my thesis as I had a coating that they were developing, and I was helping in the testing, trying to see which combinations of chemicals made the best coating. And so this was part of my internship and my thesis. And then the, actually the product came to market. So I was quite happy that something like this actually came to market. And up to a few months ago, the last I checked was still in the market. So hopefully it's still there. And then I decided, okay, it's time for me to leave the country, broaden my, my knowledge and my experiences. And I chose to do a master's in marine and offshore engineering. And I took this decision based on three pillars. One was that I wanted to do something that interested me and would take me into research and, research and design. The masters also had subjects that built upon what I already knew, the skills I got from undergraduate. So quality management, materials, and um, project management, stuff that I knew that I loved. And also it gave me an insight into offshore engineering, which I knew, well, which I know as well, that it would be the future for um, offshore wind and solar panels. So I knew that with this decision, I could build on what I know, Technology was something I want to do, and if come what may, I can use this knowledge for the future and I'd definitely find a job with offshore wind and solar panels. So, as soon as I was finishing my master's, my supervisor put me aside from me, Do you want to do a PhD? And you know, I talked with people back home when he was doing a PhD, and everyone almost pushed me like, either you do it now or else you find it more difficult to get back in academia later down the line. And the PhD is not a one year plan. If you do it part time, it can be between four and seven years. So it's a big chunk of work. So again, I wanted to work on high speed crafts. So this is what I grew up with and this is what I loved. But my supervisor told me, listen, there's a bigger problem in industry. And at the end of the day, you need to do funding to do research. So to get funding, you need to solve a big problem or be a part of a solution for a problem. And this is the carb um, use decarbonization of the maritime industry. 
and we had to look at where the industry was going and we said okay so the industry needs to decarbonize now it's your job to come up with a project that will that interests you so i managed to come up a project that you know it reduces emissions so it's the beginning i said something with sustainability it's research and design and something that i grew to love during my master was to do simulations so it combined everything that i liked together in one long project and also it gave me the opportunity to work with startups and i'll get into it now so this is a picture of the lab that i've, I've been to quite early it was a couple of weeks ago in germany where we tested a technology in a startup company so you know the it was on the difficulties of a PhD. I wouldn't have managed to go there and, and actually seen it work. Like Mark was saying, was you know sitting down and writing and doing the maths and the physics and the equations is one thing, but going on site, you know you have to fix problems on the spot. You only have a few minutes to solve problems. That's very different than so experience that gave me uh, you know, this experience. Think on my feet, etc. So now I'll go a bit into the maritime decarbonization. Uh, and its technologies and how it's related to physics and, and, and general STEM subjects. So what is maritime decarbonization? A simple phrase that does a lot of different ideas. It's, you know, basically it's the reduction of carbon. And you know, just to put it into perspective, 80% of everything that you have in front of you and then you have on your table is trans normally transported via shipping. And you know, look at this diagram, we can see it from, from 1990 to 2020 in 30 years. Shipping increased by 70%, and currently it produces 2.3% of all CO2 emissions and 3% of all greenhouse gases, and it's equatable to between what Japan and Germany make. And it's exp and expected that um, the shipping will grow between 50 to 150% in 30 years' time. So shipping is here to stay and only to get bigger. So now we have to tackle the problem how are we going to reduce these emissions? And as Mark mentioned before, the IMO they have like a take part, sorry, take care of everything that has to do with shipping. And they came up with this strategy that said, okay, either we're going to follow the green trend, come up with new technologies, new regulations, and hopefully be carbon free by 2100 and reduce 50% of all reductions by 2050, or else we're going to go up the blue trend and you know, business as usual. And we're going to improve the emissions, and and that gap is gigatons of CO2, so that sort of CO2. And you know, one way to do this is basically just with simple subjects as physics, maths, engineering, and the chemistry and biology that Mark mentioned before as well. And I'll put a few pictures of some technologies that look simple. Like you see here, this is wind powered. And a few years back, if you thought our oh, ships are going to be wind powered, they tell you, oh, we're going back 300 years in time. But this technology is, is being developed. It is um, its reduction in emissions is very impressive, and probably is going to be here to stay. It's being applied to more and more ships, and probably hopefully we'll start seeing more of these ships around. Another one of these technologies is gated rudders, which is simple, which is change of normal rudders, but this change can reduce emissions and fuel savings by up to five percent. And I'll show you these images. Basically, these are all technologies that are being applied to ships and being tested. And as Mark rightfully said as well, you know, this takes in you know, maths, the physics, you have to be a biologist, chemist to work on different fuels, to work on coatings for um, for the ships to reduce the rate. So it's, it's uh, a mix of everything together trying to, to solve this problem. And also, as Mark said, you don't, um, even if you're a lawyer, or you know, this project needs a lot of finance. So you have accountants, bankers, investors. Even they need to have scientific knowledge in these subjects to move up to to help promote the solution even further. And as you can see, a lot of different technologies. And you might say, oh, oh probably I'll, I'll have a chance to work in these technologies ten years from now. But the technology I'm working from myself is already fifteen years old, and it's no one year optimized. So probably by the time you get to graduate and work on these technologies, they will still won't even be optimized. So there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work for everyone uh, in the future. And now I'll just give a bit of system on what I what I do and what is it. So I work on air lubrication systems. And what basically this is, is you're injecting air underneath a hull and you're reducing the density. And all the physics people here will know that the equation of uh, the equation of friction is related to density. So reduce density, you reduce the drag, 
save fuel and you save emissions. And like I said before, I really like sustainability and nature, etc. And one thing I found that's very interesting for me personally was that this technology already exists in nature and it's called biomimetics and it's used in plants and also in penguins. So um, when, you know, when penguins are still swimming, they need to jump onto the ice. And to do that, they need a, a huge, um, a large boat to get up there. And one way they do this is they fill their feathers with air, they, they um, dive downwards. And as soon as they're getting, uh, as soon as they're resurfacing, they, they take out their oxygen from their feathers. This increases their speeds and they manage to speed out. So you now you can see how, how simple technologies can be explained using nature. I mean, looking at wind power again, but dozens of ships. Pirate ships or what Spanish shoes actually has a lot of examples that one can use how to explain these technologies. And so, so what do I do? So um, I'm I'm trying to optimize the system, and I do is break down the system to different parts and trying to understand it. And I do I use that using simulations. I call it computational so dynamic simulations. And as I said before, I try to work with startups to improve their systems and make their systems even better and for application of the system I used before we managed to go to a, a laboratory and do a testing hopefully when that they get to install it I'll go with them as well and maybe spend a day or two at sea to test it and I can you know doing a PhD and it's not very hands-on unfortunately and like I said before I was very hands-on person but um, when I used to go to careers everybody pushed me or they told me on you're quite good at academia just stick to it for now and later down the line you get the chance maybe to work with your hands. But you know, once you do a PhD, etc., it becomes very difficult to leave your desk and do maybe a hands-on job. So and then so other project I've worked with was Stanford Britain, where poster of an abstract of work was accepted in the UK here and was presented at the House of Commons. So it was a very good experience to go out there, talk, meet MPs, even though unfortunately I didn't know any British MPs. Um, another project which was designing battery housings for electric cars. Um, this came all of a sudden. My friend was doing to me, yeah, join us. So she was to get out of it. And we managed to pass through the preliminary stages, we went to the finals, and actually worked with um, housing developers in Germany. So as well a bit with industry. I also did this project which is early care researchers or European project called Emporia 4KT, where they gave us a, uh, a low level technology that hasn't been developed. And then it was our goal to, to in theory, see how we're going to promote it, see how to do marketing, the financing, try to find chip owners, how to apply it and apply it to different markets. And I'm also a committee member in the Royal Institution of Naval Architects branch here in the Northwest of the UK, Liverpool. And this will basically create seminars and create networking events to continue to spread the message. Um, so tips for future generations that I wish I knew when I was younger. So base your career on something you are passionate about. Even let's say you want to work in the maritime industry, but maybe you're not academically inclined. You can always do other subjects that we go to see, as Mark was saying, but it could be a maritime law, um, maritime finance, there's a lot of other options you can do. Try to always be aware of future trends. For example, like when I went to career advice when I was younger, nobody mentioned computing or IT. And I'm sure that most people that are attending here can can code better than me. Like I need to learn coding, but I never got a head start to it. And also look at where the trends are going. Like I was doing for my PhD, I want to do high speed crafts, but the trends was shipping decarbonization. So I saw what I wanted to do there and applied it to another problem. Try to take on as many new experiences as you can look at the new experiences, what can you learn? And anything that you learn, see it as a transferable skill that you can get and apply to other jobs and other parts of your life. Um, get get involved in projects outside your comfort zone as well. Like for my case, the electrification of cars, I'm not a, I know how to drive, but that's it, I'm not a big, big car fan. But at least it, it gets you to look at you know, other problems, how you can apply your knowledge and skills into other problems. And then, then there you can see that if you have a problem, you boil it down to the basic blocks. You can see how you can transfer your skills to what was needed. Something that probably future generations getting a bigger help knows interpersonal skills. So um, you know, the skills to communicate, 
to get your message across is very important at the end of the day. If we don't work all together, we can't move forward as a society and as a community. So learning to communicate, get the message across and working together is very important. And at the end of that, never stop learning, always be inquisitive and never give up. And that's it from my side. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. I, I must say this, you embody uh, integrated STEM and STEAM teaching. Like the, the research you're conducting is an entry point to every STEM subject possible. Uh, and and it does so in, in a very unexpected and intriguing way. That's a, that would be a great way to get students um, very, very on to studying STEM. The, the, the air lubrication system that you're working on developing is, is just absolutely brilliant. Um, and teachers are encouraged to, to talk a lot to their students about sustainability. So this is a very, very cool way of, of bringing it up. Uh, you know, you would not expect that, you know, to make a ship uh, produce fewer emissions or use uh, less energy, you'd go and look at penguins. So that's very, very cool. Thank you very much. And, and I think it's it's always a bit of a surprise. I think maritime transport uh, for a lot of people does not necessarily, uh, is not the first thing they think of as, as a, an industry that produces a lot of carbon emissions. Uh, it, it, some people that are very concerned with climate change know it, um, but you know, if you ask a child or if you ask a student of, I think of any age, what are the industries that are most polluting? They'll go to aviation, they'll go to cars, uh, and they'll think, well, you know, a boat is green, it's on water, it's fine. Uh, so I think the work you do is very, very important, uh, and we thank you very much for it. Now, you've shared a lot about um, what students, the kind of, the kind of, I guess, skills to some extent that students should have uh, to be excited about STEM. But do you have more specific advice for teachers on how to how to approach uh, STEM teaching and and how to get their students passionate about STEM? Yes, definitely. So you know, thinking back, I was looking back. I was have preferred if the teachers I had could have shown me. STEM subjects of them being applied, you know, like maths is very theoretical and just numbers and numbers and letters on a paper. But if they could at least show a few images, like um, a few images, a few videos, how it's explained, how it's done, and uh, technologies may be complicated, but the the you boil them down, like I said, it's mainly just simple physics. So if they could take, like, for example, wind, you're applying wind across a across a, a foil. You've got forces, you've got different changes in pressure, uh, and this is how your ship is moving forward. So maybe it was more visual, I think more people would be interested. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think it, you are you are preaching to the choir, and that's going to be very useful for a lot of teachers, uh, whether they teach physics or not. Um, well, I think that takes us to close to the end of this webinar. Uh, so if you have any final questions for our speakers, now's the time. Um, you can still post them in the chat and we can address them a little bit. Um, otherwise, it is time for me to do a little bit of reminding to people about what's happening. So the Back to School campaign is still running. This event, uh, Hot Skills, with the STEM Alliance are part of the campaign and there are a few more webinars coming your way. So uh, keep an eye on the website, go check it out, go register. Uh, there's some very cool things still happening until the end of the month and early next month. The Scientix TV Endeavor is a very exciting one if you want to get students excited about STEM or if you want to get ideas on how to do that. So um, go check out the Scientix TV episode. You can uh, click on the link. This is a link in yellow here, so you can click on it. This one is about STEM careers and how to get students uh, really into them. More episodes are coming every month. Uh, next time we'll be looking at technologies, immersive technologies in the classroom and how they can help uh, with STEM education. So go check them out. It's a very cool, very cool endeavor. And finally, the Scientix conference registrations are now 
open. You've all been waiting for them. Uh, they are there. You can click on the link. You can go register. The conference is one of the major science education networking events in Europe, and it provides an overview of the challenges and opportunities in science education and highlights the potential and possibilities that the scientist community can bring about. You can learn, you can connect, and you can generate new ideas for inspiring STEM education. So check out the website, register. Uh, it's happening on the 18th and 19th of November, and it is online this year. So I guess that's all for today. Thank you very much uh, to the three of you uh, for joining us. Are there any final comments before you go? You're both very silent. No? No. Uh, thank Janet, you no. Mark, Andrew. <laughs> thank you. Very no, thank, thank you, you for, for this joining. opportunity. Thank you. It's been very exciting to have you. We have traveled. We have learned about exciting ways of looking at penguins uh, and about the green future of transport. So that's very, very cool. Uh, and you will be able to find the webinar online very soon. Make sure that you sign the signatures list if you haven't done so already. Without it, no uh, certificate of attendance. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been my great pleasure to host this evening. Uh, thank you to our participants and thank you to the audience. And I guess we'll see you next time. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. See you soon.